the objective of this session to learn a bit outcome of our session project, which is now more or less as the official will end end of December this year. And uh, we are quite convinced that we can achieve uh, very, very good results, which we also would like to bring somehow to the market later on, but you will see it also in our presentations. Uh, what we have planned for today is a brief overview of this perspective also from the commission side from Timo Russell. So welcome to my summit if you are here and I'm also tying also in our session to give some, some uh, overview about point of view from the commission side here. Then we will have a short presentation desk where we go through what we have achieved so far so that we have an idea of what the session is about and what is the outcome of our project. And at the end, um, go over to some panel discussion. The reason also have maybe the possible answer question in the audience. So that's more or less the program. And uh, now I would like to hand over first to Kimo. If you can start with your presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay, can I start now? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, uh, I'm sure you have seen me by now. Uh, so I'm from the data commission in the Um I will speak on the slides you have seen many times already. And by now, know by heart what is the European data uh, policy and strategy and the, the legislation that is going up. So I will not bother you on this. Uh, but I am tired of hearing about the data spaces, uh, I'm sure. So that I, will, I will also skip this slide and I go straight to the one that is uh, the more custom made for this uh, session. Uh, and because uh, the, the topic of the session uh, on compliant consent uh, is, is very fascinating because it's uh, um, uh, close to, to my, my favorite topic, which is uh, um, compliance technologies in, in general. And that we, it's one of our most important tasks for us is to provide uh, the community, uh, the businesses, uh, administrations with tools uh, to confront this increasing uh, burden of compliance uh, from, from legislation. And that we started big time already uh, by GDPR. And, and that was the main inspiration for our, our first wave of uh, uh, projects, technology, uh, RD projects uh, that address uh, the, the area of um, uh, compliance. And, and so, of course. When GDPR uh, arrived uh, five years ago, uh, it, this was riding on the wave of uh, increasing awareness of, of privacy of individuals. Um, and uh, that's why, why we had already in the 2016 work program of Horizon 2020, a small topic uh, that maybe went unnoticed for most uh, of ICT-18, something in for pioneering project. We call them pioneering project it was the first time we were addressing compliance technologies. So in this case, privacy preserving technologies. Um, and because one of the things we realized about uh, GDPR uh, that, that is it's very hard for legislation to comply with, that you can completely escape uh, GDPR uh, if you hide the personal data, so if it's no longer personal data, okay. Um, so if the data you can you can uh, anonymize or pseudonymize or some otherwise uh, in other some other ways uh, make the individual disappear from the data, GDPR does not apply at all, uh, and and that's very convenient. So we thought that uh, with this. Preserving technologies, you can make the individual disappear, but we can still maintain the value of the data. 
uh, it turned out not to be so easy, uh, or especially anonymization seems to be almost impossible uh, because with, with smart you know, combination of data, data uh, assets, uh, having enough data points, you can always uh, reconstruct the identity of, of, the, of the person. So in the end, if you want to anonymize uh, really efficiently something, uh, you have to remove all the data about the individual. Because then, then it's safe, but then you have nothing left. Uh, but then it's, of, of course, safe as well. But so that's the ultimate uh, anonymization. So uh, we had uh, three research uh, projects and, and one uh, uh, coordination and support action uh, from this first uh, way. Uh, very interesting because it uh, opened our eyes. Then we had the second wave of privacy preserving technologies uh, that were in connection with the data platform uh, projects. Uh, some of you may have followed the session uh, this morning, this marathon session with, with uh, um, many presentations on the data platform project and the new projects that we're going to take over from them. Uh, so we had two um, uh, pillars uh, of this topic, ICT 13. Uh, in uh, 2018, we had a call addressing the research and innovation action. So there were more research oriented. Uh, so questions about uh, homomorphic encryption and, uh, uh, and this kind of uh, techniques that can be used uh, 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 and, and federated machine learning, uh, putting the algorithm where the data is uh, instead of uh, uh, taking the data out of the same repository. Um, and we have uh, in total 13 projects. So that was already a, a bigger exercise and maybe a more systematic approach uh, to privacy preserving technologies. And now uh, we are now seeing the results. So these uh, research innovation projects were complemented by the innovation actions uh, that are where they actually the data platforms themselves, and data platforms in different contexts uh, dealing with difficult data. So uh, with uh, data that is industrial or personal data or data that is uh, very valuable for, the, for its uh, owners that they, they, they want to hold on to that to the, the values, uh, data that somebody is very nervous about. Um, so um, then we have now uh, well, ongoing, the first project started, starting, uh, they have actually started uh, a few weeks ago, a few months ago. Um, so, uh, the topic uh, now it's from the Horizon Europe program, data 0101, compliance, privacy preservation, and green data operations. So, uh, now we are adding uh, new uh, elements to compliance. So, it's no longer just privacy preservation, but it is other aspects of uh, uh, compliance, uh, it's about uh, smart automatic contracting, uh, it's about uh, also uh, the, the environmental compliance, uh, so the green data operation, uh, reducing the uh, energy footprint of data processing. And we have uh, another very uh, exciting topic, uh, also first of its kind uh, in our, our programs, uh, data 0104, it's a bit later, it's a uh, topic of 2022, so uh, the projects are only about to start now. Uh, uh, data exchange, monetization, and trading. We have four projects. It's a small small thing, but maybe we will uh, have something bit bigger uh, later on, uh, if we have encouraging uh, uh, results firing out from this uh, small portfolio. So this is typically how we operate. We, we uh, launch something uh, uh, the first time without really knowing if it's going to work. And then if you see that, okay, uh, maybe it's worth uh, uh, studying it more deeply, and then we launch a bigger uh, call about it. Um, well, one next opportunity I want it also to mention in this context uh, is that we have this topic, which is not yet public. It's uh, the work program that will be published in the next week or two, 
uh, it's, and it's for the year 2024, uh, data 0101, AI-driven data operations and compliance technologies. And now the compliance uh, is starting also to encompass artificial intelligence uh, related compliance issues. Uh, this morning there was an interesting presentation by the Swedes uh, about the, 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 re the regulations, the different legal uh, frameworks. And they talked about, I, I'm very glad that they mentioned Article 10 of AI Act, because it's giving something very scary requirements for uh, uh, data governance uh, or high risk AI uh, applications. So if you have a high risk AI application, you must make sure, for example, that the data that is used for training that uh, those applications, uh, that the data are relevant, representative, complete, and free of errors. Now, how on earth can you measure that? Uh, how can you make sure that, uh, that this is the case? And yet, to add to that, uh, how can you ensure that your data is free of bias? What is bias? Can somebody explain to me what is bias? And can somebody explain why is it a bad thing? Isn't it a normal thing, a normal human thing to have bias? Because it's something that guides your decision. It's something that, uh, something that uh, you know, um, brings in the experience, life experience that you have. Okay, so there are, there are a lot of words in the AI Act that, that may have uh, very interesting consequences when it comes to compliance technology. So we will see uh, what, what is in front of us, but let's not worry about it. Today it's about consent, so it's still very easy and, and basic. Uh, according to GDPR, so this session is about compliant consent. So what is compliant consent? Uh, consent, uh, by the way, is a very co convenient thing because if you obtain consent from the data subject, you can do almost what you want with the data. If you put that in the, in the consent, uh, uh, information and but but there's a catch for uh, for the consent to be effective in eyes of the GDPR, it must be freely given, specific, informed, and that's a difficult one, unambiguous, uh, possible, and it, uh, and it must be possible at any point to withdraw, uh, revoke uh, the consent. And if the so if the consent is to be given. Uh, uh, only in a request by electronic means, which usually is the case, the request must be clear, concise, not unnecessarily disruptive uh, to the use of the service to which it is provided. It's almost uh, impossible to, to uh, address all of these requirements at the same time. But uh, so maybe this is the base, this is uh, the, the background against which we can maybe start now uh, looking at what are the solutions for. Uh, compliant concept. Okay, that's, that's my. Well, I, I would say. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe we can go on to the other slide deck. Bear this in mind. Remember that. Okay, thank you. I'm going to skip that slide because it's a typo. Um, so yeah, from now on, we're going to just uh, keep this in two sections. So there's um, a brief presentation, and we are going to keep it brief because we're going to get onto a panel discussion because we want to look at um, some of the things around why are we doing this? Why, why is this project important? We've seen this from Kimo from the GDPR and the compliance point of view, uh, but there's some real business reasons why we're doing this. Uh, it's not for fun um, and just because there's a problem to solve. Uh, so we want to articulate what these problems are and what we feel the impact will be having solved it. So we see consent as a barrier uh, to growing the data economy. Uh, GDPR has put some 
really good and clear boundary conditions around the use of personal data and the requirements that have to be in place for the use of it. Um, it's, as, as Kim all said, it's made people aware of uh, data privacy. That's that's a great thing. But in our world, uh, in the consortium's world, and it's uh, very important to many, many consumers, there's data that can be used for benefit that's actually very difficult to use for benefit. And this is, this is really what we're addressing. So if you look at the challenge in terms of um, where we stand today, um, Explicit, transparent, easily rescindable consent. It's all part of the principles that Kimmel just showed. Um, but also, there's the, there's the threat that if you get it wrong, you can actually be paying an awful lot of money and you can have an awful um, impact on your brand. And when we're talking about connected car data, I don't think there's any of the brands that would like to be associated with data. In fact, the fines are so big, potentially so big, because they're revenue based, that it almost negates the, the, the business of using connected car data in the first place, which is not good for the economy. Um, and what it's forcing is the implementation of specific and what I would call island solutions, so standalone solutions for consent, which is fine, but it it actually prevents data portability, which is the forgotten part of GDPR. GDPR is supposed to allow a consumer to have his data as being portable. And if you can't do that, then truly you're not really being compliant at all. Uh, so standalone solutions make scaling difficult, but also make compliance difficult, difficult portability um, difficult. And consumers become incredibly confused. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples. What we've done with Smash Hit, if we've created a platform that addresses those concerns. Uh, that's made it much more easy, much easier for a consumer to give consent for a specific thing. Um, we've used two connected car use cases, that's insurance, uh, that's uh, ours, I represent LexisNexis here, and Smart City, that we're gonna hear about too in a second. And what we've done is we've, we've given a very, an opportunity for a consumer in a very complex environment to give single click consent, which really boils it down. It's transparent, it gives um, very clear uh, possibility for a consumer to rescind, and um, it's ease of access for a consumer to go and see what consent is given and to, and to act upon it. So that's what we've done. I think I'm going to hand over to you here. Yeah. <clears throat> so thank you, Nick. Um, my name is Mohamed Arifai, I'm from Volkswagen. I just want to briefly underline what Nick already mentioned, why this is so important from the uh, OEM perspective as an automaker. So for us, uh, GDPR compliant data, data sharing is key. Um, as you know, nowadays, data are like um, smart solutions. You have a lot of software, you have digital services, you have a lot of interactions with the system. There are a lot of data generated, a lot of sensors, huge amount of data, so on and so on. And um, there is a huge potential in using this data, exploiting this data, not just for the automakers to make more business, more profit, money, but also to provide innovative new services for the customers. For the owners of these data, uh, you can think of uh, predictive maintenance. You can think of uh, a lot of digital services in the car, and so on and so on. A lot of AI-driven services. All these kind of uh, services and innovative uh, solutions need data to use. Provide them. You need to use the data that has been collected by the vehicles, and for that, you need to have concepts. You cannot just do it because you have access to the data as an automaker. I'm just showing here um, a screenshot from a report from McKinsey showing the potential of uh, using these connected cars data in different areas, different domains, um, on the um, manufacturer side, but on the customer side, side. And that's why it's really important to have a way to handle um, these concepts and, and use that. Um, failing to adhere with these GDPR rules is, has really, really um, great impact. 
And uh, as Nick already said, fines are so high. I mean, 4% for an OEM is really huge. And you don't want to take this risk. So that's why most of the time OEMs are too restrictive and too conservative when they are dealing with this with data. They have to be sure that everything is compliant, of course. And this slows down the development of new services and so on, yeah? because you have to be careful. That's why it's really crucial to have a solution that so um, makes it easier to deal with data, to handle consents, and so on. Um, also, um, the existing systems today for, for um, collecting these consents from vehicle users are not so optimal. Uh, they're not so advanced as we know them from other digital devices. And this leads to lower rate of opt-in. And if you have not enough opt-ins, then you don't have access to more data or to enough data to develop new services. So that's really also important to have a solution for that. And again, I'm talking about the leakage. Um, you don't want to be responsible for any data leakage. So if you are an OM um, a car uh, manufacturer, the last thing you want is to have a data leakage and you are, that you are responsible for this leakage. And you know, in most of the services, you have to deal with other third parties, you have to share the data with other third parties to provide the service. And that's why it's really important to have a way to find out where data leakage occurred um, to be accountable for that. And that's why solutions, innovative solutions for data use traceability are very important for, for us. Um, say, having said that, I will um, hand over to Becca to also get his insights from the smart city perspective. Okay, good afternoon all. Uh, I'm Pekka Kupan, I'm from Polo Vidium Helsinki, which is an uh, innovation company of the city of Helsinki, fully owned by the city, and that's a public sector organization, but much more agile than the city itself. So we have 50, 60 people uh, looking for new solutions for the for the city. And like in this project, we are the test bed, as you can so place to test new services and, and can be something which is very concrete, like the cars driving there, but also the digital in the digital world, how do we the concept and I think the, the city city of would like to provide customized personalized services for the citizens because now it's possible because of the digital digitalization and then we bump into the same same problem as uh, as the others here well explained that the GDPR is kind of providing tools to build trust that the citizens can trust the city but then it can be block also the development of the services and even within the city there's a lot of personal data, I mean, services based on using personal data, so within the city organization, it's hard to share data, so the concept is needed even there, and of course, between the other uh, outside players, external players, companies, and and, and, uh, and that's where we, we've we been testing the Volkswagen uh, uh, solution in, in, in Helsinki, so how to kind of combine personal citizen consent and the consent uh, of the drivers, and then the city feedback app there is uh, it's uh, uh, I think there the, the first concept that you, part of your personal information is included, but what we are really proud there that we, we were working on to make it easy to approach and that is graphically using the interface to give the concept would be as more than possible that to go towards some kind of way of presenting that. So that's uh, one theme there, there. And then the last thing is that for the city, uh, Helsinki has claimed to be a my data operator, it's so important, so there's a solution. Helsinki has part of it is already before the smash hit project, and it's of course utilizing the smash hit, smash hit results, uh, but the interoperability is, the key, is key for the cities, and the, the whatever solutions they are, so they're not kind of a vendor specific, so that's why there's the FASTO group and smash hit that we'll be working on, and then we work together also. FASTO is responsible for, for the city of Helsinki, uh, uh, yeah, so the other use case in this program is about insurance, um, and every car needs to be insured. Uh, so you've got a 100% overlap between consumers who buy cars and consumers who buy insurance. There's this growing um, thing called UBI, which is usage-based insurance, a uh, wonderful term. What it means is personalized insurance. It's personalized around how you drive your car, where you drive your car, how you use your car, etc., etc. Uh, so there's a range of data points that you need 
operator. Now, insurance companies have got involved in this uh, quite significantly across multiple countries. And because insurance companies operate on risk, they look at what the risk of the insurance is, what's the likelihood of having a claim if I pay out. Um, they entice people to share their data um, quite significantly. So as much as 30% discount you can get for being monitored. Uh, now, some people call that I'm being paid a big brother. Uh, others say, well, that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good thing. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's not quite as simple as it seems. Um, and this is where GDPR becomes a bit of a barrier. Uh, so you've got the consumer here who says, well, 30% discount, I don't mind being monitored. That's great. I'd, I'd, I'd love to buy that. So I have to give consent th at least three times. In this, in this case. So I had to give consent to the insurer to, to use my data for the policy. I had to give consent to the car manufacturer to collect my data. And I have to give consent to the car manufacturer to share it with a data processor called LexisNexis and processes that to provide it to the insurer. By the time the consumer has gone through all of this, he starts to have more questions. So what happens to my policy? What happens to my data when my policy finishes? What happens? my data if I sell my car, does the, the does data continue to be uh, provided by the vehicle? What if I change my mind? I want to rescind consent for whatever reason, what happens? And by the time the consumer has gone through all this, guess what happens? He just buys a normal policy. He doesn't use the data at all. So we just kill something which is going to produce a great benefit for a consumer. Um, that in a nutshell is the reason why we entered this program. Uh, because our business is about processing data for insurers. Um, so what if we could solve that? What if we could get connected car data being used for multiple industries? What if, what if we could solve this consent problem uh, and allow things to open up? Well, if you look at this, the European data market is pretty large. Uh, it's got a compound annual growth rate of 6.8%. Kind of nice, it's growing quite nicely. But the connected car park is growing at a compound and growth rate of 30%. There's millions of cars on the road where data is not being used. Millions. In fact, tens of millions and probably up to hundreds of millions of people floating. Usage based insurance itself is growing at just short of 27% from a very significant base. And smart cities are growing at 24.7%. And, it's, and these are the markets or the applications we've contained inside the project. If you look beyond that, consent applies to smart health, it applies to smart home, with significantly larger growth rates than the growth of the economy today, the data economy today. So maybe we can do better than 6.8% if we actually address it. That's that's quite, quite a good challenge. So we need to look at how we've done it, right? I'm going to hand over to Anna. So, we are on the technical side, and Anna and from the ATP Grammy, so we do uh, coordination of the project, but also some of the development. Um, and our solution to solve this problem, this problem is already um, stated, was to build a platform. So, as uh, we've seen, we have several sources of data, several uh, platforms that we want to um, provide uh, consent uh, um, to. And so, we developed this national platform that uh, has in itself several tools. And they um, provide then the, the user management this is, um, inside the platform. Also, uh, together with the uh, consent uh, certification um, platform, um, to, uh, yeah, the functionality, and together with the other tools such as the automatic contracting, provide uh, to the PR compliance um, verification tool. Um, this also can um, help you in your data um, and in creating your uh, contracts for um, the use of. Of data. Uh, I'll go to the data use traceability in a minute because I, I just want to say that the security and privacy tool will work 
um, together with the, the automatic contract to provide your um, um, privacy by design uh, um, uh, functionality. So uh, that's the, the granular security of, of your consent and um, um, how it's uh, then in, in the end implemented that it's um, all secure. Um, also inside the, the platform, we have the context sensitivity tool that will um, at, at some level provide some, some user preferences so that you can say, okay, I just want my, my um, data to be shared um, in this sector or in, in, the, in another. And um, so this all being in this independent platform, and uh, what I haven't talked about yet is the data usability tool, who, which is actually the only tool that will need to be a uh, part of it installed um, on, on the data platform side and will allow uh, for uh, data fingerprinting and watermarking so that you have, um, that you can avoid some data misuse and um, that you are sure that your data is not uh, being sold somewhere else and that it's really just for, for the use that you intended to. Um, and all this, um, we developed also a semantic uh, model um, called the, the Smash It Core Ontology. And um, this uh, is not only for the internal functioning of, um, of the platform, of the tool, but also for interoperability with, the, um, with all the other actors. And in a sh very short example, just saying a, a little bit how this could work or the, how this works at the moment. Um, so we have um, on data providers or processor organizations that want to um, um, have their uh, APIs, their, their applications um, uh, certified uh, with a certified intent by Smashit. They, um, we have some standard APIs that they use to um, um, define the consent. So the organizations define these consent terms following the, the semantic model that we've defined. Um, they uh, then go to the data owners and uh, get this this uh, consent uh, from from them to to use the data, and um, this will then be communicated with Smash It, which certifies it uh, and supports this consent management. Um, and on the other side, on the side of the user, they will have or they have at at any point uh, the opportunity to go to Smash It and to um, see all the places where they have data consent because this, at the moment this is really something that is not transparent at all and and um, I think it's it's great that data owners can can go and see um, where they all give consent and maybe even revoke maybe not in a direct way but some somehow to say okay I've given consent in all these places then um, maybe I have to um, yeah. Do something to, to, to change this if they don't want to. Yeah, thanks. I think, I think one of the really important things that comes out of that previous slide is the fact that this whole consent piece is sitting away from the data. The data is beneath it. Uh, it interacts with the data and it just allows it to flow. Uh, so I'm um, just thinking of some of the things I've seen during this conference and some of the things I've learned. And think about data spaces that we've talked about quite a lot. Um, but I uh, think about the consent to use different data from different data spaces is going to become parallel. Uh, and the way Smash is built, it could sit above. A variety of data spaces and allow services to flow based on the data that's contained in those data spaces. So, what are we going to do with this? Uh, so, we're coming to the end of this program and we have a plan to put all the building blocks uh, to be available as individual, less usable element. Uh, that's, that's clear. But having solved the business problem, we, we have a desire and a belief in, in a solution. And what we want to do is we, we want to actually commercialize, productize this, this whole solution. 
Um, so we came here with a couple of plans. We've, we've had some discussions about the um, the thought process on the left. Um, it's going to be quite a difficult thing and a very lengthy thing to do. Uh, there's no question about that. And we have a full understanding why there's all sorts of legislation going into place. It's got to be navigated, etc. Um, we also have a second plan, which is to work directly with um, OEM partners that we have uh, to build a connected park and scent management solution. Now, the nice thing about this is that because vehicle manufacturers have their own consent platforms, flash can sit above it and just actually consolidate the whole consent environment. Uh, so it doesn't mean that the vehicle manufacturers have to kick out their, uh, their, their current consent mechanisms, they interface it into flash in a very simple way. So we believe there's a, a future in a very, uh, I don't know to call it narrow, it's pretty big, it's a big narrow, but uh, uh, the connected car data space to allow uh, connected car data to be used commercially and unlock some of the potential. So this is this is the uh, the thoughts around the next steps. We see this as a complete win-win uh, for the consumers and the data industry. Uh, it's uh, it brings things together. Um, Without consent, as, uh, as Kim said earlier, there is no data. Uh, there is no personal data, therefore there cannot be a service. Full stop. So we see this as a as a big win. Um, food services consumers get benefit. It supports GDPR because it's built on GDPR. It's built around the, the regulations. And actually looking a little deeper, the the digital decade and uh, stretch supports is totally aligned with uh, everything that is trying to be in place today. So um, we are very proud of what we've done and we're very happy to uh, answer a few questions around this. Uh, we've got um, uh, Christian who's going to act as the moderator for the panel and we've got a few members of the consultant are going to come up and sit up here, take a look. Is it have it on it? Yeah, there you go. I didn't know that was there. And Kim on. Thank you very much. Also to all other presenters, Anna, Mo, Tinker, and Timo, for giving an introduction and explaining where Smashup is about. And uh, I just think it's a very, very good for partners active in the project. And I think they also for a lot of other data processes, data owners, but uh, this is very, very good for uh, the end user, the citizen, yeah, so that they have also much more trust and much more in your solution that they can work with. But however, I think from presentations, there are still some, some questions that we can talk about in this panel, and that's exactly what we try to do. Uh, let us see because we just have, as far as I know, this 15 minutes left until the session is over, so therefore it's not so much time for, for answer questions. I guess maybe we just drop in. So uh, we saw at the end a statement from, from Nick, uh, so that the whole platform is a win win situation at the end for as well data processors, data providers, and, and citizens. Um, so maybe also a question to our smart city partner here, Pippa, from, from Helsinki. Is this also part of you from, from, from your side and work on what you implemented what you have in mind also for the future for your services? We would like to have those too. Yeah, thanks. I can continue from that because uh, when we testing with the citizens, of course, they, the citizens are they are the residents of Helsinki, but they are both not in private, some of them. Are. Oh, then yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but still it's kind of in the everyday life. It's, it's, uh, to have this kind of solution that the concept is managed somehow smoothly and, and, and kind of, it, and it would be easy to understand also what, of course, there's clear need for the, for this solution. And, and I think everybody benefits. It's really, it's not an easy task, but, but then you, you get this done so that there is a bunch of further so that it is, uh, Need is there, and we see all the bit of kind of promising results already from the applying the solution. And as you saw, that the city really has claimed to be a very good mining because the city is one to utilize my data also as an organization. So it's really cool for them. 
Ein bisschen mehr Beispiel kommen dann an die Apps, also can say that more or less a common view and uh more easy and difficult to ask also folks right now this is about that. But uh we also go back to the presentation and uh look from from the uh, point of view of the audience you can get at least the impression that everything which we have done here is only for car data. Because that's very really centralized, but you can see in all our the use cases which we have covered there, uh, we have developed solutions which are based on car data. So does it also mean that the whole smash it solution is something which is restricted to, to car data or is it something which we also can extend to, to other uh, data from other areas or in the sense that we also can integrate data for example from uh, health area or something like that. Or is this maybe technical problem? Yeah, thank you for the question. So uh, we actually think that the, the value of uh, Smash it, even as you said, uh, and Christian, even if uh, it might seem like uh, it has been designed for uh, Smart City and car only, uh, really there's nothing uh, technically binding us to, to a specific industry. So we could, uh, we could very much apply everything to, to different domains, like uh, healthcare could be, could be a start, but really, really the semantic, uh, the semantic model that supports uh, kinds of uh, it's really not, not domain specific, so uh, you can uh, adapt to everything. Um, I really think that uh, actually the, the, the point of Smashit is to try and, uh, as, as uh, Nick was uh, pointing out, to try to make it a, a standard in consent. So not, not really for a specific industry, but uh, for any kind of the uh, name. So we, we absolutely support that and I would be pretty much uh, wishing to, to do that. Let me just add one point. I mean, of course, uh, on the top of Smagin and the data our data and sharing our data, but I, I can just say from my experience with the product that that was not my feeling that the uh, development is only for our data. And the main thing is that what I like in this solution is that you don't have to send the data to Smash it. So Smash it platform just manages its consents and the data uh, resides at this source. So uh, that sense, you can use it for any other kind of data. Thank you very much, Paul, also for your comment on that. So I'm also thinking back what was presented also by, by Nick uh, to mention that it's maybe quite important to have their standard solution as an end so for such a platform. So uh, you explained it a bit, but maybe it was also makes sense to go a bit deeper, more uh, detail. So why it's maybe not sufficient that we do today that we have their own solutions uh, for different areas and for different companies. Well, the standard um, individual consent solutions have been necessary. So I don't want to say that they're wrong or they're bad. They, they exist because that's the way that, that uh, the consent requirement is. Um, but it does get in the way. So if, uh, if if you're a consumer, and let's just take our use case just, just for a second. So I buy a Volkswagen car, and I use the Volkswagen consent mechanism to um, give consent for my insurance. And my wife then goes and buys a Skoda car. I'll, I'll use your group brand, um, not, not to go off track. Uh, a different consent process, a different place to go manage it. So now I've got two places to go. I cannot have a complete overview of all the consents I can uh, So for me as a consumer, it's kind of nice that I've got a way to access the services that I want to have. But it's not complete. And then if I had my smart watch for health and I had my whatever, I'm giving consent all over the place. And very quickly, I've forgotten where I've given it. And I, I don't know where to go anymore if I want to change my mind. With Smash Hit, we've got the user interface which compiles all of the consents that have been granted and given. They're all in one place, be it a Skoda car, be it a VW car, be it an Apple smartwatch, be it whatever it is. It's all listed and those consents are there. So I can manage them in one place. So for consumer, we've really simplified it. And that's what I mean by, uh, you know, if you have standalone solutions that are not bundled together, they, 
they work, but they're not they're not always on the same level. There was a comment on this issues from other panelists here. So I think that was clearly explained. Also, I think was also very good to explain during presentation, particularly the what your view on this is very helpful. But the uh, reason for that, as you also mentioned in presentation, is at the end this consentatic issue that you have to give as an end user for getting service contract uh, comes in a different place. It's not only once, you have to do this twice, three or four times, and then have also, at the end, not the overview, where you have given consent for what, for how long, and what is covered by the consent at all. And this is exactly what I think also is maybe then at the end, the factor which will uh, uh, yes, hindering the industry to implement some of the services. But this is also maybe a question here because we have people from policy side here in both. Is this content party issue something which is also a concern of, uh, of, of you that you have on, on your agenda? Um, yes, it is. Um, uh, I see this. Um, Concern management touching upon the uh, these uh, general design principles of the data spaces. Uh, first of all, uh, one of these general principles is to ensure compliance with the prevailing legislation at all times for all the data spaces. So, irrespective of how, how different they are. And other relevant uh, this hexagon uh, picture I've shown so many times. Uh, another relevant uh, common design principle is the, uh, the interoperability and portability uh, requirement, uh, which is of course obvious uh, that, that uh, it allows the different data spaces to play together. And because they cannot be isolated universes, uh, they will be uh, they will have to interface with with, with each other and to be able to exchange data and not only data but exchange services allow services that require different data space that have to question different data spaces so therefore this concept of having a portable uh constant management is is interesting because it it's uh kind of addresses that design principle as well um, and yeah my advice to you because this smash hit is one of these uh, in, uh, one of these uh, data platform projects that are supposed to give you know, uh, uh, tools and, and uh, lessons learned and, and, and uh, uh, something for the for the emerging data spaces uh, some ingredients for the uh, emerging data spaces to, to solve some of their problems so that's why I see it's, it, it, it's very valuable uh, what you have developed uh, in this national project uh, and that I see is next step is that it would become part of the this toolbox that tool, different tools are provided uh, to the data spaces not all of them will handle uh, personal data and uh, some of them will don't want to handle personal data if they can avoid it some others cannot avoid it so help uh, as they uh, finance uh, smart cities and communities uh, um, will will be handling personal data at some point uh, even if they want to then to get rid of it if they or, or anonymize it so that uh, also management should be part of the, uh, the toolbox now uh, of course our policy is always to and, uh, to avoid exclusive teams and that, uh, that there are several tools provided by, by, by different providers they are all welcome of course and um, but uh, maybe at this point there are not so many tools around so that it's not a question of uh, which of the five to take if there is only one for the time being so let's uh, try to enrich this toolbox uh, and uh, now that 
the, the industry is out. They, they haven't really started yet. Maybe there are some of the rare ones that the cancer images and the uh, um, genomics ones are the ones that are, are the forerunners uh, that, that we are maybe starting early. Others are spending one year in the definition phase. Uh, so it will take some time uh, before something comes, comes out uh, of the pipeline. And, but what I appreciated in your presentation of last week was this uh, calculations of the growth rates uh, to, to assess the potential of this market. Uh, and but then it comes also to the uh, part of the analysis should also be that what does the consumer think? Like so, it, it, statistically speaking, so not just asking one or two, but uh, big big numbers. Like uh, what would be the response? Uh, from the field, how many would think that this 30% reduction in the insurance is sufficient for them to change? Then that would be an interesting uh, finding uh, because then we will see that what what is the reward to the, to the user that it, what does it needs to be for uh, for the user to adopt the, uh, the system. Uh, we always need to keep in mind to, that we try to solve the right problems and not to solve a problem which is which is not the right problem. <laughs> and I was uh, uh, thrilled to see one of the data spaces project that, uh, at the end saying that we are not sure if we are, we, are, we are solving the right problem. I think that was a very good uh, outcome and very valuable outcome of a project because that's that's uh, we also need to know. Uh, which are the problems that we should actually pursue and the, which are the ones that we should abandon. Okay. Thank you very much for this very nice and precise uh, answer. And if you already had also the next question in my mind, it's just already answered in the sense that uh, you also think that these are understood it from what such a kind of of all data space that is required here handling um, the, the content management, at least which can be used, it's not a must, but which can be used and also by other data platforms. And uh, by this, also solving this problem of content. So it's, it's in, in the room, and it's something which is hindering the, the implementation of services which we heard here from, from our partners. So it's welcome that we have also the support here from the Commission side. And uh, therefore, thanks for the comment. And however, when looking back also what we have seen or all discussion here, so the most, most thing discussed is for sure uh, around content and content uh, process uh, uh, improvement in the sense of like to make it much more easier, but when you look on back on project, what we have done in Smash we also cover this. This was especially something which came up by data provider like uh, Volkswagen here in the group because this is always a big elephant in the room, <laughs> making maybe big big problems. Uh, you don't want to have uh, the data scandal, Volkswagen data scandal at the end. This is something which we have to avoid, and I think it's, it's valid for all big OEMs, not only for carbon, it's the same for Linux and so on. And however, uh, maybe you can can also tell us a bit something about this, uh, what you also think about from your perspective, what uh, you think, when, when this should be needed, because we know from, from project outcomes that this is something which is still in development phase. Because it's not easy to solve the problem, uh, especially if we think that we would like to, to cover by such technology, not only data coming from the internet, it's open also for other areas, and putting watermark and fingerprinting technologies on data in an easy and economical way, uh, not using too many who is uh, uh, yes uh, also power from from technology point of view so it's not so easy but what you think uh, if this is not in place is this something which will hinder folks are for future to bring data up and marketplace tools so is it something which needs to be clarified urgently 
Yeah, I think so. Um, so we have done during projects on evaluation with uh, more around 140 um, possible uh, users to, um, you know, evaluate the, the, the flow concept, you know, using existing solutions and using the uh, smash it concept, which will speed up this. So we are in the project, we're going for one click concept, um, giving a concept management, which is very important because this makes it much easier. But at the same time, we've seen that these users are also just still interested in knowing, okay, if I give my consent one click, still want to know who gets the data, who um, shares the data, and where does the data go to and close. So this kind of data use traceability is still an important issue. So you need to balance between the two things. You want to simplify the process of getting consent, managing consent, make it so easy for the users, but at the same time, Give them the possibility to be able to uh, see at any point of time who is getting my data, uh, who has received it, and so on. That's a very important aspect for the users. Another aspect is also for the um, uh, car manufacturers. You want to be able to prove that you didn't cause any possible data leakage. If this happens, of course, you want to be able to say it was not mine, not me who uh, uh, caused this data leakage if it happened, and um, show that there have been others who received the data and it happened somewhere else. I think this is for both sides important for the users, for transparency, for the automakers or the data providers to um, be sure that uh, I can go um, with this solution and I don't have to risk too much. Thank you for the comment. Uh, when I look on time, so we are already at the end of our session, <laughs> so we start a bit late, so therefore uh, it's, uh, time is running. But before we close, I think that at least uh, should give your audience also opportunity if there are questions, so that they came up with questions which we may can answer here by the panel. Some one question is nice. Actually, I have two, I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, the first one is um, which domains do you think uh, are the viable domains that will adopt the solution? And the second one, we see similar approaches taken by uh, data spaces. And also by uh, data pods like Timberly, will this eventually converge? So, what's your take on that? Would you like to answer from all the panelists? Quick. It's like a bit of clarification. When you say which domains, do you mean which data producing domains or which data consuming domains? Like any, the one with multiple files, one with the market. Yeah, but well, I mean, we, we put some of these up here. I'll, I'll, I'll pass the mic over to you. Um, as, as Ivan mentioned, we, we built this platform to be actually data producing device independent. Um, so it can apply anywhere. Uh, if you look at those, those market growth rates, there's some very clear front runners as to where you would go next uh, with this. Um, you know, we've, we've got three kind of encapsulated in, in the program. Uh, healthcare is a, is, a, is a clear area uh, where um, I think there's, there's an awful lot of potential of, of data sharing. Um, and the interesting part is you've got a completely different set of data receivers. Uh, even though it's for a consumer at the end, but then you're dealing with maybe hospitals, um, health analysts, whatever. So it just, there's other complications around that, but that is a, is a massive market with our aging population, et cetera. Uh, so I, I think that is probably uh, would be on the list of the, on the next place to go. Uh, I can comment, yeah. It's, uh, of course, I see it from the city perspective, but still, the healthcare is the most difficult. There's, kind of, there's really a lot of better, that's clear, but that's the. Of course, the challenging one because it's so private thing, but still we're working on that. Also, but even mobility, I don't know if it became clear. So, if we can kind of, it's kind of a secondary use that the city can use the data that these commercial actors are. The commercial actors are providing the everyday services, also retail shops and you know, food, you know, food, mobility, all of that. So, if 
the people can give guns and that city can utilize that data, which they can't at the moment. So that's the so then the planning of the city will get better and then the life of the citizens get better. So if we really get there, so then I think the clear benefit. And like mobility is if you ask for the first runners, so so kind of so clear that they are um, I mean, parking, EV charging, Volkswagen ID, uh, it's kind of a complex thing that there's a lot of, and city is providing part of the parking services and EV charging, and then the public, I mean, private operators are doing that same, and, and it's, uh, the data doesn't really flow at the moment, but if that kind of a data flow with concept would help to, to improve those services, so there would be new players for, I mean, also business-wise, kind of a new, new opportunity. I think that's, that's VC as a kind of a, Interesting, not that's as difficult in healthcare, but uh, still very much important for the city. Maybe I can, I can uh, put a few thoughts about uh, the convergence with the other solutions in the, in the data space. So, so we are, uh, I can answer this uh, from, from two sides one from the ASMASI member, another as ATOS member, what ATOS is planning also in. And uh, smash in that space. So, uh, from one side, as, as massive, we, we are in contact with, uh, coming in contact with the uh, pizza, uh, and we have actually submitted uh, four uh, blocks uh, to, in, to incorporate in the catalog. Uh, if I remember correctly, they were uh, the semantic model, the concept manager, the automatic contracting tool, and the data use to usability. So, we have submitted those four modules to try to. Uh, push them into the into the ITSA catalog and and try to try to uh, keep uh, working into uh, making them standard and converting and, and making them uh, work with our solution. So that's uh, so that's one point. And uh, also, uh, personally, I can I can talk about uh, how we are uh, tackling this in in Atos and we are. We are right now also uh, trying to build in the, in the research uh, department a uh, uh, data space. Uh, we have to put uh, together a data space. We are currently uh, studying the issue and, and, and seeing what kind of uh, assets we have. But we are uh, we see very uh, very much an interest in in pushing uh, in pushing the concept manager uh, layer into this uh, space because this is something that uh, I think I've seen. Uh, yeah, affects uh, any kind of business. So we see some, some interest in pushing this forward and even if nothing uh, could come out of, uh, of uh, transit, we, we will still be pushing it uh, inside, our, inside our, our own assets. So it's uh, we go. It's question answer by Good. We have any a question from the audience? Doesn't seem so. It's already late and we have a lot of sessions behind us after two days. I think people are tired and uh, full with all the stuff that they have heard and followed today and yesterday. So, therefore, before we really close the session, I maybe would like to just give you the opportunity just for one hand. So, a final statement and the sense what you think, uh, from your perspective, is possible to do So, there are some issues that we have to work on. Maybe one second. One second. Okay, so I'm just reflecting on what I've seen here in the first two days of this program. And I, I came into this program, into this event, feeling that we've, we've really done something um, positive for the data environment, that we created a platform that was very relevant. I'm sitting here today thinking, I actually under, underestimated that if we created something that's essential. Uh, without, without a multi-class uh, for that platform is concerned, environment, this data economy was back name. Uh, especially when you get into data spaces that differ. If you cannot connect those two things together under the con clear consent of a consumer, we're, we're, we're going to rocket speed to a war. Uh, so I, I, I changed my opinion and I, I, I don't think it's going to be good anymore. Thank you.
Yeah, I can say that we have really enjoyed working on this project because one of the things that I most like is that we're not just um, trying some ideas um, uh, in some simulation environment, but we really did an end-to-end -end integration of our whole components, including some real vehicles, and um, have uh, been able to see that it really worked. And that's something that we don't have always in uh, some research projects. So I uh, have really great results. Yeah, I have a quick uh, question public sector uh, organization. Again, we are for interoperability and we try to avoid vendor locking, which is really, it, uh, there's proven to be a problem. But I think here still, I would say that, uh, but I like here that the commercial, like real businesses having the ability to that they present because you have to show the value first that we are kind of concrete enough that you have to, have to show the first cases at work and give value to both the citizens and companies and not the cities so, so that because then you proceed it out if you try to plan a perfect ecosystem and then implement it you want to let somebody else do it. So uh, I don't want to repeat any any of the any of what has already been uh, mentioned by my colleagues. I just want to, to say that uh, it's been nice to, to be part of this, uh, this project. And I think uh, if, you will, if you go to, to our booth uh, later and check out the, the videos of the demonstrator that, that, uh, that we have uh, running on the booth, I think you, you will see uh, the kind of use cases that uh, this kind of system enables. So it has been really nice to, to have the opportunity from the, from the commission and the funds from the, from the commission to really invest in this and to, and to make possible uh, this kind of solution and as we, and as we discussed to, to uh, try to incorporate it into other uh, domains and aim for the best. Uh, yes, uh, so it's a very promising uh, a project uh, and uh, uh, it would be interesting to see that the final uh, documentation and uh, the results of uh, the uh, evaluation your your users uh, share it uh, uh, share it with uh, probably with uh, with ITSA, with, uh, with the data spaces business alliance with the data spaces support center you know they all together again and uh, uh, it's a uh, very valuable ingredients for them so the catalog that you mentioned uh, is, is a good starting point uh, adding these components to the catalog of uh, so the toolbox, uh, and uh, and then the work doesn't stop here because then it's uh, it, it's not that that uh, the customers will come to you that you will have to go around and preach and uh, continue that uh, for them. But the roadshow must go on. It's it's just uh, it, uh, uh, the market is still so immature or non-existing that, that there is still some new stimulation that we all have to do uh, but it, it's i think we have a good start uh, by this uh, data spaces uh, ecosystem yeah that's a final comment it's exactly what it also hopes that we finish the project and everything will stop and i also have not the impression that like that. So I really have a good feeling that the, the outcome of the project is something which we bring some of the life and uh, maybe also can, can bring our ideas and spread our ideas further also inside uh, the program of the region. We can also support and bring our experience. Uh, so also would like to thank you for our support during the whole project and also our partners here. <laughs> Because it was not really not easy uh, to mention that funny started directly pandemic period in 2020, and the first year was not really not easy. Face to face meetings, uh, we have to work for two years just with telephone conferences, but uh, even this works with some the results which we have. Uh, so the was there as a coordinator was a big thing to the whole consortium to everybody who contributed to our results here and I hope that uh, we can achieve also something that we can bring later on to the market and convince also other partners that our solution is something which is of high value for them. So many thanks to you.